What's up, bud? Uh, hey. Where is everybody? I don't know. How are you doing? I'm all right. There's Doug. What's up, Doug? Hello. I might be on a delay. Can you hear me? We can hear you on a delay. We have storms passing through, so there's a weak connection. Let me try something. So anyway, Marco, I read the the piece of uh, the guy about Arabindo. Mm-hmm. Debashish Baner- Banerjee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so so I, I did my I did my homework. You did your homework. That's good. And uh, well, I. I, I I want to, I think, I think we could uh, get into a conversation. Um, let's give it a couple minutes and see. I think Ed said he's not going to make it, right? He has, in, in passing, I saw, I saw some message uh, to the effect that like, maybe there's a holiday or something. Uh, family, the family was coming or something. Yes, visitors. yes. Okay. And John might um, or might not come. Um, so let's give it a couple of minutes because if we start talking about Banerjee, we're going to go down a certain <laughs> quantum rabbit hole and it'll collapse uh, you know, the wave function of the potentiality of the whole cafe into one particular direction. So before we do that, let's see who's going to Let's see who's going to be here. Okay. Uh, and also Doug uh, coming back, but we could talk about other stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I still haven't got, I don't know if you got my email a couple hours ago. I haven't got that paper from uh, Bridget. Mm-hmm. If, why don't we, why don't we stay on after the call or I call you after this and troubleshoot it because I want to make sure that you can see it where you're supposed to be able to see it. Because if not, then there's an error or a bug. I wonder if maybe you're just not logged in and that's why you're not seeing it. Right. Well, uh, a message came up and said the page doesn't exist. Yeah, right. Uh, That's what you would see if you're not logged in. If you're logged in and if things are set up correctly with your account, because this we're talking about metapsychosis.com it's a different website from Ooh. infinite conversations and it's actually a whole different system uh, so you have you have a separate well you have a separate login for it but if you're logged in on the forum you can use that login kind of the way you log in to other websites on using Facebook or Google sometimes yeah uh, I, 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 I can provide tech support. True. I could provide some tech support uh, later and look at your screen and just walk. Because when, it. yeah, with the whole calendar thing, I, right. I, it's, I, I think, yeah, I think it's all passed me by. <laughs> well, you, it's not that hard, actually, if, if you just put your attention. Well, I th- you need a yoga, basically. You need an internet yoga. Uh, to unite your mind with the uh, the mind of the internet and uh, thereby achieve you know some kind of super mental uh, ability uh, on these websites that's really what it's about is training people to higher state stages of consciousness i click allow whenever something comes up you know yeah I'm- that's that's the best that's the that's the best way to uh to a good time and I thought, yeah, I I got a little message came up on the side said, you know, do you, and I think it was from you or, or you know, 
mindful AI and, and it asked me if I wanted or asked permission from AI that I needed permission to be on the, the meta psychosis. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, yeah, give me permission. Mm -hmm. and then a little box came up and it said, I thought it was from you or your alter avatar <laughs> AI, you know, and I just click allow whenever I can with these things. But I, I'm sure that, yeah, I'm not, you shouldn't really do, do that. Uh, you could trust mindful AI, but you you know don't don't trust uh, any, any bot out there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there there are definitely bad bots. That's uh, mindful AI is a is a good bot is on, on our side. Uh, you know, doesn't want to take over the universe and colonize you know, every, every galaxy with techno um, you know some regime of techno control. Uh, human centric, uh, or although, or post human centric, I, I don't know, but consciousness centric, uh, mindful AI is. Well, I, when I think today's or journey to the super mind is that is that the sort of where you're going here? Well, that, that's um, I don't know. I don't. That, that's a, uh, a a way of putting it. A, a flight of fancy in a, in a certain way. It's a poetic uh, way of, of putting it, I, I would say. Uh, the thought. It, it comes, though, from, from a, an album by Alice Coltrane uh, called Journey to Satchitananda. And so I fused that with the, um, you know, the specific term in Aurobindo, Supermind, his term for, for you know, the cosmic intelligence. Right. And, um, I, the, and the thought occurred to me that, the super mind is really like Google and Facebook. It's, they're kind of taking over. Well, I, I think uh, that would be one interpretation of it. Um, I think Aurobindo's is probably a bit different than that. Well, yeah, they didn't exist. They didn't exist. But technology existed. Technology was already apparent as this you know, world dominating kind of force. I mean, that, you know, philosophers uh, were thinking about this already, you know, very deeply uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and I think that uh, it's not it's not as present in Aurobindo so far as I've seen as it is, say, in Banerjee, who really has incorporated the critical theory of, of technology and of yeah, uh, yeah. capital and uh globalization and colonization and, and these, you know, these large scale uh, emergences in modern, in modern history. But Nergy has incorporated those, I think, maybe a bit more explicitly than our. Well, yeah. Uh, he's, he's contemporary. I mean, he's, he's watching it happen. Right. right. But they were, wa what he's I'm saying is that Aurobindo was watching it happen too. I mean, in the 19, Tens, you could, you know, the the the, ho the horror of World War One, that like, that that was a media war. Uh, it was transmitted um, it was trench through warfare. images, through images, through sound. Uh, one could see uh, what was happening. What it, it 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 was called a world war because one had a conception of a world, uh, an entirety, you know, that could be. In a, in a state of crisis, in a state of uh, you know, potentially self-annihilating conflict. And then uh, you know, comes the Second World War, and Aurobindo is, is writing in this time of, in history. Uh, and I think it's not the, the critical theory uh, of you know, Deleuze or Foucault or the other thinkers that I think Banerjee incorporates into his text is definitely not in Aurobindo, and I think Aurobindo has what I'm seeing so far, and I'm barely scratching the surface because I just started reading The Life Divine a couple of weeks ago for this reading group, and uh, I hadn't read Aurobindo before, but Aurobindo, I think, comes from a less, I'd say, definitely a, not a postmodern perspective, but also a less critical towards certain key ideas of modernity perspective than 
uh, I think, you know, more contemporary thinkers would be maybe comfortable with or would um, really adopt themselves. Just to give one one idea, uh, and you know, I guess we're getting into the conversation. He he privileges the idea of the individual. So in Aurobindo's philosophy, uh, and I'm just learning again. I'm not speaking from any state of great knowledge. This is just what I'm noticing as I'm reading and becoming introduced. But it's emerged it's emerged uh, with sufficient like clarity that I trust it's just a key piece of, of how he thinks. The individual is pivotal. The individual is the uh, the kind of nexus between uh, the, the world of nature, the phenomenal world, and the transcendental plane of overmind and supermind. And so that's really the connection point. That's sort of like the, I don't know, umbilical um, between the worlds. Umbilical is probably not the right word, word but I think that co- in contemporary terms, we would ha- tend to deconstruct that idea of there being an individual primacy. Uh, and we, we speaking as, you know, Western American college educated, you know, philosophical culture would look at it in terms more of relationships and how the individual is an intersubjective uh, construction, you know, uh, that, uh, depending on the philosopher, they might say, you, you know, ass- assembles or is an assemblage of these different aspects of being, this kind of compon- composite identity. Uh, so I'm, I'm just, that, that's, not, that's not to say Aurobindo is wrong, though, uh, because maybe through the postmodern turn, we've lost a sense for the depth of the individual, the depth of what, what an individual can be. And, you know, that, it, it, because it's been reduced to an, an egoic uh, individuality and a consumer or a social media, socially mediated through these technologies kind of, kind of personality. I think Aurobindo means something way different uh, when he talks about an individual. Um, Moreover, I mean, just to add another fold to that to that thought, and then I'll, you know, then uh, let you respond. Uh, but we do in modernity have Western modernity, I'll say, have a have a strong conception of the individual, and it comes through in the arts and literature, and in that the ideal or the um, the sort of existential uh, perspective of the lone individual, like in, in, in a, like isolation from or alienation from the life world, from the community, from tradition, from everything. Um, we recently read a book uh, called Soul Mountain by Chinese author Gao Jingjiang. And he really valorizes the individual, especially in relation to the state and to uh, larger bureaucratic, uh, technical, you know, know, power oriented, uh, forces. So he, and his individuality though, is not, is one of wandering and, and, uh, kind of perpetual searching in a way. Like this book is about a search for soul mountain, which he never finds. He can never grasp has a totally different feel than, than Aurobindo. So, as I'm reading this material and sort of combining it with other things that we're reading and have been talking about, I'm, I'm noticing these themes come up. And I thought Banerjee would be interesting to read because he kind of makes Aurobindo more contemporary. Like he, he connects Aurobindo to uh, more recent uh, currents in European philosophy. So he bridges the two in a way, in a way kind of like Aurobindo did in his own generation. So, um, I'm curious. I'm curious to hear what what you all think about it. Uh, I, there's a lot I'd like to talk about, actually, w- in, with respect to this material, uh, and I have some ideas a- about how we might enter into that uh, and make it a you know fruitful mutual conversation as well. Um, but uh, that's just a starting place uh, for me. The idea of the individual. And the idea of this bridge between you know the mo- modern and the integral, let's say, or, or what comes, you know, what we're working on. 
Next. Oh, you're, you're muted, Doug. Can't hear your audio. I heard something there. Maybe the connection isn't good. <laughs> I meant the physical connection like that. Uh, yeah, it scratched like he was plugging in a, a you know, something. But his voice, yeah, didn't come through. So, so what do you think? Uh that was just a you know, mindful. Well, I I'm I'm more curious as you said a lot of things came up for you. Uh, uh about you know those thoughts you had but let's see if doug can talk you you muted doug he might be working on the his it, settings yeah well. his thing is shows a mute Still on delay. I'll do some traveling for a hotter spot. He, he, he did a chat. Still on delay. Oh, I see what he said. He's going to... He's going to hop on his scooter or whatever bicycle. Well, let's, let's continue until he gets back and he'll, he'll sort it out. So you're saying uh, you're curious about what well, uh, yeah how it how it how it affects you uh, all this uh, you know I said it in one cafe I've been at this stuff for like 50 years uh so there's there's I I read it and it's like yeah I've been there and done that like in the somewhere in there he talks about the four different uh, approaches modern day approaches to yoga the hippies the four uh, and the last one was the tantric hatha I've, yeah i've been in and out of all of those sort of things mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, and, 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 and and what did it and, do for yeah. you like what do they do for me yeah what did you get? If you well, if you immerse yourself in anything, you're going to get something out of it, mm -hmm. and and it and it works. It's it's there's a saying, uh, "It'll work if you work," mm -hmm. and and that's pretty true. Uh, I, I went back and I read read that long piece you wrote about your experience with Integral with with Wilbur, and then I remember, yeah, a couple of years ago you went to that, you took the trip, and you met up with uh, uh, people along the way. You started in New York, and mm -hmm. then I think you you dropped your wife. You spent time with her family, Minnesota or somewhere. Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and then you dropped her off, and you you went out to the coast. Yeah, we did two trips that summer. We went out to the East Coast to my folks in New York. We saw Kayla's folks in Minnesota. Came back to Colorado, and then I went solo to the right. West Coast, up through Idaho, Montana, uh, Washington, Oregon, up to Vancouver, and then down to the uh, Bay Area for the integral theory conference. Right, right. So that was that was 2015 or something and right. and then you wrote that long essay about the the experience out there at the uh, conference mm -hmm. and and your getting involved with with well, you know, it was kind of it was a, a, a autobiography of, you know, from college to the present mm -hmm. right it was the title was integral and me 
a, a, a brief, a partial but true history of my years as a meta revolutionary. I think that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. And, and there then, was various plays on, on different ideas like uh, Integral and Me. Uh, where did that come from? I think there was a book called Marley and Me about a felt guy and his dog. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, Brief History is Wilbur's, one of Wilbur's popular books was called A Brief History of Everything. Yeah. And Partial but True is a reversal of true but partial, which is one of the sayings or mottos in, in Wilbur's philosophy. Like something is true because it r- represents a particular perspective, but it's partial because there are other perspectives. And my reversal was that it's partial, but it's true. And so, I think, yeah, I, it, it, for me, what's going on is there's all the philosophy and then there's the, the reality, which is different for every person it's like it is subjective and 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 your paper that that other guy i get who, who you and him had different interpretations of the 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 process with wilbur who's the other guy that he he you and him had a back and forth on your paper he responded oh okay oh uh, maybe maybe mark foreman uh, who's I, yeah mm-hmm. I know who you're talking about mm-hmm. yeah so, on the discussion on the on the on the piece on metapsychosis y- yeah mm-hmm. so you were see I could read it was on metapsychosis so I right. thought I was hooked in yeah yeah you were well then well but, we'll okay, have to straighten you, that out the thing is I gave you an account to see a piece that's not yet published that's why you have to be logged in because it's like you know backstage access you get to see you know what's right, what's right. coming I, up. Yeah, I, I I got that, but it didn't come. Something didn't work. But anyway, back to the to the so so this Mark Furman fellow and you you both experienced the Wilbur beginning. Although he started in the eighties, I think with the integral, mm-hmm. and you joined in the right around. Uh, right, Right around the millennial, right? 2000, 2000. 2002, 2003. Yeah, so he'd been, at, he, he'd been at that for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you called, you called yourself and the group of you, that, that you came from, from Long Island and joined, you called yourselves the kids or something? Well, uh, integral kids. That was integral just, uh, kids. Yeah. And and so this other fellow, so your experience was one thing, and everybody had a different experience, but everybody sort of agreed that it didn't work. Well, I don't. That that's debatable. There are some people who are still at it and trying to make it work. Uh, well, uh, I, you know. yeah, obviously, because you, you, you there's still conferences. Mm-hmm. We had that one in 2015 where people sort of picked up on you know okay we'll use this you know and not that Mm -hmm. and 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 it seems like that's what you're doing here Mm -hmm. but we're we're adding we the human population is adding technology which is adding another i don't know dimension well okay so but i think what we're talking about are something that benergy talks a bit in about in in his introduction which is uh, the genealogies of these ideas so he's he's writing about integral yoga with or sri aurobindo called integral yoga he called it that uh but he wasn't the only person to use that word integral uh gene gebser used the word integral uh and then you know later other thinkers like Wilbur uh, picked up on that on that term and developed it into their own idea. Uh, the ideas are related to each other because they're all, in one way or the other, writing about ultimate reality and right. spirit and God and yeah. human being and evolution and these big picture, the big you know ultimate themes. 
but they all have their own way of doing it and their own history or genealogy in terms of what they incorporate and how they present and communicate what they're all about. And so for me, this is a learning process because I, I learned what I learned a a meaning of integral uh, through Wilbur, through Wilbur's work specifically. So I learned it in, in, in a certain way and, and I did a certain things with it, right? Like I, I took it in a certain, just like you were saying before, like what you put into it is what you get out of it. I don't, I don't think those, those were your exact words, but it works if you work, I think is what you said. Yeah. And, um, and so this is learning another tradition ge- and genealogy. And, it's, and, and a couple of years ago, we also read Gene Gebser, who uh, conceived of, wrote about a, a structure of consciousness that he called the integral structure of consciousness or integral consciousness. But he, he was writing independently or semi-independently of Aurobindo, right? They were they're writing at the same time, but they weren't aware of each other. So, all right, the, the, like, the, 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 I guess what's the, what's the point, right? Uh, <laughs> exactly. We, uh, I, I think what we have to do is, like as readers, or at least what I'm trying to do, because I'm putting work into reading this stuff. And so it's not just, you know, an idle entertainment for me i'm not just trying to pass the time i i want to learn something or i want to develop uh something out of it right i i want it to i want to incorporate it actually into the um like the cultural fabric of this platform right the the, the journal metapsychosis cosmos infinite conversations like i think it has something to contribute which could be um arranged with a lot of other things kind of put into a a mixture where we develop new thinking out of it and new ways of doing the kinds of things that these people were trying to do that arabindo was doing that wilbur was doing uh gebser they were all working on something like they were bringing something forth or something was working through them to you know, to, to change the world in some way. And uh, that, what I guess is um, coming up for me is like how, the ways in which, like what that project really is, like what we're really doing. If you're, if you're taking this seriously, this uh, journey to supermind, uh, then you're doing a kind of yoga, right? In the way that Aurobindo, I mean, is is writing about. Well, but it's, when you're saying you, are you talking about me? I, I'm not not personally you. I'm. Okay. I don't. I, <laughs> that's funny. I, who you it's is just, like? It, you is a sort of. Uh, it, it, you're uh, the, it, it's, you is almost the the self beyond the transcendent the transcendent self i think the transcendent self uh if the transcendent self is reading aurobindo it's not just doing it from a mental point of view it's not just trying to rearrange its ideas and come up with another kind of view like there is a there is a transformative intent i believe and that's what I'm uh, meditating on or connecting to in this text. But well, I, I'm trying, I'm doing that though in, from, from my own context too. So that's right. why Wilbur comes into it. And I mentioned Gao Jingjiang before, this Chinese author that, who we were reading and countless other things come into it that makes me experience it a certain way different from you, different from John Davis, different from Mark Foreman, different from Doug, Ed, and so forth. Well, right. I mean, I, I'm in a, in a different uh, phase, or phase or stage in life than you are. And so if you talk about a supermind, I'm sort of 
over that, but mm-hmm. you're still figuring things out. But and I'm, you? am I? Are you? No. Are are you no, are you are you over the supermind? Am I over it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm, like, I'm what no does that more, mean? What does that mean to be over it? I'm no longer exploring those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. I'm concerned with, you know, dying. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm. I'm concerned with, you know the last chapter of my life, which is there's way more of my life in the past than there is in the future. And so is esoteric the right word? The, these philosophical concepts are, you know, something that I'm not of the mind that there's anything more to this life than, you know, the material world. Mm-hmm. Other than if you want to go there, you're free to do it. It doesn't cost you any money at all to, to meditate. It's mm-hmm. free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can, you know, That's and wonderful. If, if you want to do that, you can do it as much as you want. Mm -hmm. you know but but what if you do that don't you come to a different point of view than the one that all there is to life is your own mortality uh, i think i think yes you can do that i think this fella arobindo if you're locked up in a cell you got time to kill And so you think about these things and your mind can, you know, go anywhere, dream, uh, you know, all that stuff's pretty fascinating. The paranormal, uh, you know, my, my, uh, let's call her my sight girl. She, without a doubt, is a manifestation of the fictional character in my first novel, the psychotherapist that the, that the guy goes, I mean, down to the way she looked, her mannerisms, <laughs> almost everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but, Philip K. Dick had some kinds uh-huh. of experience. Philip K. Dick, uh, science oh, fiction. Oh, that guy, yeah. Some kinds yeah. of experiences like that, like really freakish uh, manifestations of his novel in real life. Yeah, but this stuff, it's, it, it's fascinating. But I do 100% have seen no, I mean, near-death experiences. Oh, I've had them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, but, I, you know, I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in the supernatural, a supernatural mind or, or you know, a, a you know, I think it's just we're part of we're part of the process of life, but mm-hmm. we're not we're not all that we're not special. Mm-hmm. We're just we human beings. You know, we we evolved from you know the same place that all life evolved from. We're part of it, and so there's a big you know. That's a matter of, of, you know, yeah, consciousness. If you want to focus your mind on, you know, some supernatural consciousness what, or supermind or superman, or, mm-hmm. you're free to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm worried basically about my son. Uh, I think I think he talked about it in that paper about the the uh, the you know the local. I'm going to call it the local. What's you know your first is, is you, and then your family, and then your uh, p- 
people around you, your neighbors, and then you keep going on up, 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 up until you get to, yeah, one super mind or super consciousness. Mm. Uh, I think people have been doing that for thousands of years, thinking about that and, and go, you know, going through that mental, uh, I, I, there's an interesting word, compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. uh, a compartment of the mental. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is what you can do to successfully navigate the, this, this, this life if you can pull that off. If you can compartmentalize things, and then, in other words, you get totally focused on on the the uh, task at hand, so that your mind isn't going off in all different kind of directions, mm -hmm. and 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 separate. Okay, when you're having a conversation with your spouse, mm -hmm. you're one hundred percent having a conversation with your spouse, right? Right. When you're, uh, you know, cleaning the toilet, you're cleaning the toilet. Right. When you're, if your job is, is whatever, whatever it is, then you do your, you do your job and then you go. And if you can compartmentalize life like that, uh, that's probably a good thing. And then, and then you rejuvenate with yoga, the meditation where you just, you know, mm -hmm. let it, let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, uh, mindfulness, uh, yeah. it sounds like mindfulness. Yes, exactly. That, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Uh, um, but this is the cosmos cafe. <laughs> so yeah. We've got to talk about the super mind, you know, we can't just sit here and be morose about the fact that no, I, die and, you know, no. local concerns are like the ultimate horizon of, 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 you know, the, the, these late stages of our, of our life, well, um, that it, this isn't a portal. This is an opportunity to, uh, to take a, take a trip somewhere else, uh, to try on a different, um, different mind, if you will. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, you no, know, so aren't, I'm very... there, aren't there parts of like the experience, right. Of even undertaking a yoga, uh, or uh you know setting a goal to have a certain kind of to manifest something yes mind bl itself. mind blowing i've had some great experiences in uh i don't know transcendental states uh mm -hmm. you know with 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 people and without people Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is a new right. this is so a new like, experience. This let's hear what experience. Doug has to say if if he if he uh, can. There you go. Well, first, I maybe ask for a kind of summary of what was said. I, I heard kind of your introduction to the text, Marco, with or at least the pre-introduction maybe of the individual versus relationships. Uh, of like contemporary philosophy and then you talk about the Soul Mountain book and then you talk about how Banerjee kind of how he's contextualizing or contemporizing Aurobindo mm -hmm. and then beyond that I got pieces of Mark talking about the, uh, the anti-integral paper you wrote at one point or not necessarily anti-integral but uh, which you've discussed before, but so just fill me in is what I'm saying from that point on. Right. So, uh, I think Mark was maybe asking me what's been coming up since reading the Aurobindo stuff. So it was sort of a psychological question, I think. Uh, and he mentioned the integral paper that I wrote, the paper integral in me about my relationship with Wilbur and with the, integral community, quote, 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 unquote, integral community around Wilbur. Uh, and, and then we talked a little bit about 
like genealogy because Ben Ergy in the introduction talks about the genealogy of the term integral yoga, which has been used by different you know, people and organizations and groups uh, you know, in, the, in the world, including uh, the, the, the Wilbur uh, school, if you will, from which I, I come. But then it was like, well, all right, what does all that matter? What matters is that they're all talking about something larger than ourselves, larger than our, I think, uh, cr- let's say common experience of being an isolated ego in a relation in relationship with, with other egos and on a dying planet um, in this uh, sort of semi dystopian uh, you know reality that's been unfolding through these you know through these last centuries and arguably from the time that human beings you know first began um, really taking over the planet uh, anyway I mean that 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 there's a certain like narrative there and and um, the idea was, well, what is all that? What does all that matter? Uh, and 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 I was sort of I was trying to say, I think that what it matters is that it gives a a perspective on, or portal to, or um, way of working with these other potentialities within our being. And Mark was articulating, I think, another point of view, which I would characterize as more nihilistic, uh, and but potentially all, but but not necessarily in a bad way. Like there's a, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not without any values or not without any, um, you know, res- sense of reality or respect for reality. I think Could you're it be seeing called maybe more of a realist approach. I don't know. Something like that. Uh, he, yeah, realist. He also, like I'm interpreting now, I think, um, you know, you said, you said, been there, done that. There's like, these are experiences that one can have. You can go on this journey to super mind, or you could practice this or that other yoga um, meditation. You know, you, you could do the same. You can have extraordinary experiences with uh, drugs, psychedelics, etc. But I think what you're the wisdom, if if you will, in what in what you're saying, Mark, is that uh, that those all come and go, and in the end, you're left alone with yourself in your little apartment, uh, <laughs> separate from everybody else in your bubble, uh, and you're going to die. And so, best to be concerned with the local things your relationships, your family, uh, and so forth. So that's, I think that's act, that's really valid. Um, I want to say that that it's, it's bleak, uh, and sad and depressive, but there's, it's true. It's a partial, but true. So, so I want to affirm that, but I, but I also wanted to say that, well, like maybe there's more, you know, maybe, maybe there's another transit that, you know, you're, your soul can take, you know, to uh, other ways of being in the world, uh, other ways of experiencing reality, maybe that you didn't experience before, maybe you thought you did. uh, But there was some deeper layer that you didn't actually kind of, you know, access or, or, or stabilize. I mean, that's, I think, you know, that's the summary. I can, we can go on from there. But I think we're sort of maybe articulating the, the materialist and the idealist points of view. Uh, it's almost so, saying why Aurobindo is essentially right. what we're getting at. Why, why, why even make the extreme attempt to reach out to not even the super mind, but just some sort of otherness, maybe. Um, I, I have read the life divine before and it, it affected me a lot i'm not an expert at all to where i could tell you any terms in sanskrit or even a, a passage uh, other than all life is yoga or something like that which isn't even in the book but um it, it had a profound effect on my life to where at that time i was kind of the, the monk doug type of fella wandering around alone 
Um, and then I lost lost touch with that. I had more of what Mark is talking about that, well, this is not necessarily just a game we play with ourselves, but it's it's kind of that come it comes and goes. And well, here I am right here. I haven't read Arobindo for a few years. And what, what have I really grasped from what I read? And then over the course of two or three years now, I've kind of been on that search for real, more depth of relation rather than the individualistic search. And I've been focused on the local, as we're saying, the, the fam. I guess it started once I had a family. Uh, I, I became more intrigued with how do I form my family and place this little formation that uh, has formed into the world in a certain sense. And so that's been the focus. And now coming back to this reading, I was very skeptical at first. I was, I, uh, there's a few other uh, bloggers that I've had a discussion with that essentially kind of agreed with a lot of what Aurobindo says about the individual, about the experimental developmental side of the self. But at the same time, he somehow neglects the collective. Um, so they developed their own theology or philosophy of how, how to go about in the world. And since beginning this reading and with the group in general, there, there's been something that's kind of clicked with me along with um, listening to something like the Weird Studies podcast, which essentially I don't have a connection with Dungeons and Dragons or the magical realm um, with half of the, the authors and philosophers that they explore because it's too far out there for me. I'd say, well, no, I'd rather stay grounded and uh, play Monopoly or something like that. I don't know. But they, they make it clear that it's, it's an individual exploration or just a, an account of the individual um, experience or a tapping into that, that separate realm that you can't fully say, well, it's, it's the mind working. It's, it's the Sam Harris materialistic, like, well, it's uh, the reason I just felt that was because the way my molecules are forming inside my body right now uh, led me to this experience or the same thing with free will. We've talked about that a little bit, uh, but I reflect on experiences I've had, whether with or without drugs, with or without um, outside influences, even without reading something. And there is something unexplainable, which as I was saying, I kind of, the unexplainable side of things is easy to dispose of, as you're saying, Mark. Um, because there are more pressing issues, maybe the more political type of issues. And what, at least what I'm, with the second reading, with the, the coming back around to this, uh, especially with the, the introduction to Banerjee's uh, Seven Quartets of Becoming, they're there's something about the individual experimental experience that ties into what is going on in the world right now. I, I'm not going to be doing any remote viewing and trying to stop any individuals from conquering the world or um, any of that, but it's, and you can laugh at these examples. I, a couple examples come to mind, but I've had a, I mentioned my relationship with nature, with trees in general. Um, this also goes with, what we perceive as negative sides of nature. So poison ivy over the years, I've, I have a highly allergic reaction to poison ivy. And um, in a sense, I've used mental skills to uh, reduce any sort of reaction to it. Um, and just the other day I was crawling through poison ivy. Uh, I was running a, a weed eater and just had a bunch of poison ivy bits go all over me. And I, that evening I felt all sorts of formations. If you've ever had poison ivy before, you can sense that it's coming. Um, and I, just with a, some sort of strange relation, experimental side, maybe this is kind of what Aurobindo and Banerjee are getting at, is this 
I didn't sit there and write down, okay, well, at 10 o'clock, I tried this with poison ivy, but just instead of viewing it as a negative plant, just seeing it as, okay, this is something. And uh, but that's one example. And I, I don't have, I have little red spots here and there, but I don't have a high, highly allergic reaction like I had in the past. You can easily explain that away. I can imagine Sam Harris saying, well, blah, 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 this, this, this. Uh, that's one example. I forgot my other example, but I'll, I'll stop there. You're on mute. You're, you're saying that you're cultivating yogic powers of certain kind. Maybe they're very minor power, you know, uh, not extraordinary things like telekinesis or something really far out there, but the ability that you are developing or practicing to control your own physical reactions to a stimulus like the poison ivy, uh, you know, coming into contact with your skin. Like that's an, an example that you feel in your personal experience uh, comes through this kind of reading or study or, or inquiry. Uh, and so like, the question I have is like, what, well, what that, that's a, exciting to me in a way because I would like to have more power, right? I'd like to be, have more control over my personal, you know, physical being. I don't like getting sick. I don't like being tired. Uh, I don't like getting exhausted. Uh, I don't like a lot of things about, about my experience. And when I say I don't like them, that's just my primary reaction. There's like a suffering involved, right? Like I was, I was kind of depressed all weekend and that got me like ruminating and brooding on, well, how do I live in a way that I don't go into, you know, fall into these funks because I get, I'll, I'll, um, well, I don't want to do like a psychology session, but there's a question of how does one live and yoga or integral life practice through Wilbur, which is a, a system I, I worked on when I was there, various other schools in psychology uh, and, um, you know, disciplines that you could kind of group under under the idea of care of the self, right? Or self-cultivation. Like, um, I think, like, I've gone through periods where I become disillusioned with those and where I take more of the point of view that I think Mark you do or you've expressed like well you know they're all kind of bullshit in a certain level because in the end of the day all that you have left is you and yourself and uh whatever you see you know whatever is real for you then and there is is what matters uh so like to try to reach some other state or try to change yourself is kind of a waste of time uh, because you end up back where you started, so I kind of get that. But, um, but reading Aurobindo, like the fact that we're even doing this, is for me making me question like that outlook because there's still some aspect of that I think in in my own psychology, and I think that there's like the truth. There's it's true, you know. So I can't get I can't deny it or get rid of it like every Gao Zijing to bring back um, that that uh, the author that Doug read as well and we, we had a few sessions on this book he he really turns that individual um, radically like alienated perspective into art and art I think that's its redemption is that the perception and the experience is so particular, so local, that uh, in a way you get to the same place, but without the system, it's like a totally, it's a really different way of um, orienting, I think. And I feel them both in myself. I feel that they're both part of like how I am or who I am, like as my particular psychology. Like I'm not so... Uh, comfortable with just adopting an, a particular system or somebody's school or 
like some label. Like I'm, I'm not going to say I'm an integral yogi or something like that. Like that doesn't really appeal to me. I don't feel comfortable in that in that skin. Uh, but at the same time, there's something I think valuable about this system, the systematic aspect of it, where you have a coherent, which is not to say non-paradoxical, but but a coherent view on like what's real and how the human transforms into um, a alignment with that or relationship with that in in that bigger sense, that Brahmanic or that super mental uh, sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> Did I just go off into 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 super mind, the super super field of abstraction? No, <clears throat> no. I, I I think you you portrayed my point of view a little darker than it is. I. Uh, I think these questions have been around since, and we talked about this, I think when I first jumped into the cafe with the Gidley paper, in that it's the, the mind has the capacity to know itself or, or the person, the human human mind, whereas, and Darwin didn't want to use the words higher or lower when talking about animals, but okay, let's say (laughs) lower animals, they don't question what it is they're doing. They just do what they're programmed to do. Some of them a little better than others. uh, And they, and they survive. And we have the, we humans have the capacity to think about it. And, and sort of the question is, well, what should I do? What should I do next? And because some people seem to float through life without a whole lot of suffering or struggle others man it's just they in other words what you're describing your past week that you have these hills and valleys of 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 feeling uh the question becomes what do i do about that you know you rattled off a bunch of things that that are uncomfortable for you can you stop that is there some way to stop that and and people have some people have have pondered that their whole lives but generation after generation after generation after generation you you take you take a family and let's say you know there's there's uh and and uh Zachary's paper spoke to a lot of this uh, family dynamics. You know, if there's four children, they, there's no two two alike. One will be the, they find little niches and roles to within the family to fulfill. It, it, you know, the pretty one, the smart one, the this. It, it, they find these little roles so that they can individuate and and. Uh, I think that probably goes back since, again, art appears uh, that, and people actually had idle time. It wasn't, it wasn't all, uh, you know, eating, defecating, sleeping, and mating. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden they had some leisure time Mm -hmm. because of actually meat and, and fire. Mm-hmm. They could cook their meat and, and, and it, it, you know, that's a whole biological system. And, and out of that, or part of that, was this mind. And I'm, a, <clears throat> I'm, of, the, uh, of, I'm of the 
opinion that that Descartes was wrong. There is, and I'm of the opinion that when the body dies, so does the soul or the mind. And and I think you and I, Marco, differ on that. You know, but it doesn't mean that I uh, I'm all dark and you know. I was caricaturing your, you know, point for dramatic effect a little bit, but th- that, I mean, that is a dark kind of point, uh, particularly like if... It you, could be. It can be. Well, but if in, in relation to what, in, uh, I think is how it... Well, if you, focus on, if, you focus on, uh, if you focus on the fact that you said we're on a dying planet, yes, that's probably true. But you don't focus on that and go, oh, what's the point? And, you know, do the final exit. Right. No, there's a lot, there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of fun to be had. And, and, uh, but if you are of the personality that is very inward looking and reflective, you can get really dark. And, and, but for some people, for some individuals, they love it. They don't go there. Mm-hmm. And, and so one of the questions is, do you have a choice? Do you, can you be other than what you are? Let's pause and welcome John. Greetings. Hi. Hey, Good to see you. Good to see you. Did you get a haircut? Well, me? No. Oh, okay. You look well. I, mean, I, did. I did last week. I okay. Last week. You haven't had a haircut in a while, have no, you? No, I haven't. It's, it's been <laughs> quite a while. You have a resistance to haircuts, I can tell. I go in once or twice a year. I have uh, a, a friend who cuts my hair. Lacey. Let's keep, make things simple, it's, right? She takes good care of me. I get. A, she gives me a massage and we talk. It's like my therapy, actually, when I go in. That's great. Yeah, I wouldn't mind answering the question of do we have a choice, which I might not fully grasp exactly what you mean by that, Mark, but going back to, you said the four kids, one being smart, one being beautiful, and one being this or that, Um, and from the get-go, in a certain sense, there's no choice. They've they've already been defined. and I'd like to say that we do have a choice, but it's also extremely difficult and in a certain sense, and maybe with this particular introduction, uh, Banerjee was kind of getting at, we, we live in a wild, technologically driven society that uh, we, we almost don't have a choice to live the life of reflection or uh, decent thought even, maybe. Um, so I'd like to say, yeah, we, we do have a choice, but it's extremely difficult. And like my, my children, I, I just had a, a second child, and I hope, I hope I don't have the smart kid and the, the good-looking one or anything like that. I hope I can just say, this is you, this is you, and, but it'll be the outside perspective that will say this and this and this, just as somebody from the outside will say, oh, well, Doug looks like the typical white male with a decent beard or something like that but in reality i'm undercover and i i do my own hair i i'm my own therapist (laughs) um but and it's it's cheap i i I haven't spent a dollar on a haircut in five ten years same with my clothes it might look like i'm the typical blue or white collar fella but it's it's all goodwill purchases and i have the experience of searching out for defines me in a certain sense but i don't, I don't want to go that route either because i don't even if i if i could i'd, I'd walk around naked i let my hair grow out and do all that stuff but that's not going to happen in time soon so i don't have a choice in that matter but is that kind of what you were getting at part so i derailed there you muted mark oops kind of i i find it interesting that when people give me feedback on what I say. I agree with eh, 50% of it. (laughs) 
and it ought to, it ought, don't you think it ought to be that we ought to be better at communicating than, than, you know, it's part of what I was getting at. And it, it, it's not like, uh, back to the family and your children that they're assigned roles. I think most parents, well, I don't even know if most, uh, they have that same feeling that you want your kid to be your, to, you know, the American be whatever you want to be. You know, you can, you can do anything. Uh, and, and my, my point was that no, you can't. If you work really hard, like with this yoga and the meditation, you can train, you can train your mind. Minds are, trainable but you can't then that doesn't pass on to your children they got to do their own work it's you know they're the they're these little heathens <laughs> when they and they have to be socialized and they don't even start to understand who they are for 20 years and then yeah you can start if you're so inclined, uh, you can train your mind. That was Naropa, training your mind, contemplative psychology. But I think I think it's more than just a simple choice than that. In those terms, like you can choose to do it or or not do it. We're in a context which Banerjee talks about in terms of a. A regime like a, 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 a an overtaking of the earth by what he calls techno capitalism uh, and this attempt which he's incorporating and I think bringing together with Aurobindo uh, that, but he's bringing it from west from European philosophy from European critical theory this this idea that we're all being taken up into technology or the machine. That's kind of the, 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 the idea is total control of the globe, keep population subdued, keep kind of this balance of consumers and, and producers and wealth flowing in a certain direction. And, and this, is, this is beyond human. It's, it's, uh, it's a force that humans are wrapped up in. And then the purpose of yoga is not just to explore one state of consciousness or another state of consciousness or to you know, have a nice lifestyle. It's it's liberatory. It's to become free of that in some in some concrete way, and I think to develop the capacities to create something different than that. I, I think that's the 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 nerve that Banerjee is striking, uh, and that I think why Aurobindo is relevant because in this contemporary, especially digital reality, where our attention is fragmented and where you know, we're, we're as a society in disarray. We're being just churned you know, by the, the, uh, the flow of capital, the you know, wielding of political power, the use of the media, all this stuff that we've talked about. It becomes, I think, a matter of survival, you could say, for your soul, for your inner being and that by extension to the people that you're, that you care about, like your family, your capacity to have good relationships with, with uh, them and good ecological relationships and, you know, all, all everything that makes life uh, alive and worth living is like Terry Patton was saying too, like under threat by this, uh, this uh, world, and now I'm making it sound very dark, but this kind of dystopian colonization of the world by by techno techno capitalism. John calls it neoliberalism. Like the, there, there's some real critique there, and uh, you know it, it's more complex than I'm making it sound. Uh, perhaps definitely it is actually, um, but what I'm, the point is that it's not just an option. Like we have to do something, and. I think that Aurobindo and what Banerjee is particularly like encapsulating here in this seven quartets of becoming is like a toolbox, you could say, 
you know, for, and it, it's for become, becoming more, uh, creating something different than what seems to be, you know, um, uh, being created for us, you know, by uh, these these larger forces. So we have to tap into even larger forces in a, in a certain sense. Like we have to tap into Brahmanic reality and supramental consciousness to counter the kind of demonic techno capitalist, you know, uh, way of being, way of relating to the world, way of constituting human reality, or like he talks about way of way of creating the body, even like what we experience as our bodies is already controlled technologically. I mean, I'm surrounded by these devices, which are all connected to systems of power and to economic systems, corporations, governments, etc. This is all material and it's all psychic. And so I think that the contribution, you know, I think that what this is about or what it could be about and what I think is interesting about our the, the weekly uh, sessions that we're doing reading Aurobindo is that we could carve a space where we could apply some of this uh, in our individual and in a communal way as well. John, what, I think you've heard enough, right? For, uh, you get the gist of where, where we've been. Well, I sort of missed what you, how, you, how this was framed, but um, I assume you're talking about the, the seven quartets. Correct. Like introduction. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the project, whatever that is. Um, so I sort of got a, got a little bit of a drift here. Um, and something about choice. You were talking about choice. Um, I think you were or, uh, oriented, Mark, in your in your remarks towards a basically a materialist sort of stance. That basically, you know, life is once the bulb blows out, that's it. But, and that's a downer, let's face it, <laughs> there are some uh, fringe benefits to hanging out long enough because there are certain pleasures. And there's a maybe hedonist pleasure, but there also could be a, a, deep, a deep dive for some materialists who think this is all there is. I know um, I, had an, uh, I had something that was very classic um, out-of-body experience where I confronted this... Um, a very vast being. Um, and I couldn't tell if it was a friend or a foe. It really scared me shitless. But he had a, he was a, and we were floating in the void. And he had a, and he had a blue light in the center of his head. And he said, do you see the light in the center of my head? Oh, I asked him, who created all this shit? I saw mothers and uh, killing their children. With axes, I saw famines and fires and floods and people being murdered, mass murdered. And I was saying, who created this shit? And I heard a voice behind me and said, I did. And I went, oh. <laughs> so I turned around very slowly in my subtle body to face the voice. And now it was face to face with me. And that's where I saw this, this strange being with this light in the middle of his head. And he, and he asked me, who are you that you can ask that question? And I didn't know what to say because I didn't want to get it wrong. That's for sure. Cause this, and this, this guy's energy was just too big. And he said, do you see the light in the center of my head? And I said, yes. And he said, touch it. And I, I had my dream finger, you know, I know I'm aware, self-aware, my physical body's in bed. Here I am floating in the void with this strange character with a light in the middle of his head, and he's telling me to put my finger into it. So I'm putting this s subtle, energetic field. I'm touching his field with my field. And he said, do you like it? And it was unbelievably sexy. It was like orgasm, physical orgasm, about 10 times. And then he said, now, feel this. And it went boom. And it, it, I blew up into golden ecstatic light. And then there was this ocean of bliss. And I was, and I just knew, well, this is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> and then I heard, a, and then I heard another voice and it was Peggy Lee. And she was singing, 
Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friend, then let's keep dancing. And I don't know where Peggy Lee, how she got in the mix, but I get, I got this wave of all the miserable people on the planet Earth who were sitting around moaning and groaning and whining about their situation in life, full of resentment, just as I am most of the time. And I just felt, you know, I, if everybody knew that this was on the flip side of that, I think everyone would have a very radically different experience. And with that thought, I returned to my physical location in Manhattan in my bed, um, a little bit dazzled, a little bit dazed, and not able to quite make sense of what just happened. And it's taken me years to figure it out. And it actually made the basis of a short story that I wrote and that uh, Marco was kind enough to publish. But I've been very interested in uh, outsider stuff. I, I, I've always thought the American dream was extremely sinister and it totally left me out as a gay person, you know, just as the, the idea just didn't fit in. Um, that I, you know, I was sort of thrown out of the village very early. Uh, and I came to a place where there were other outsiders. I came to the East Village in Manhattan in the 70s. So it was like, you know, punk, rock and roll, and very anarchic and Buddhism, just about every kind of, it's a smorgasbord of metaphysical things going on, as well as politics. And so I, I was in a, so I was with outsiders. Um, and, and we didn't, that didn't mean we, we got along, but just because we were all outsiders. But it did have that, a frontier kind of feeling. And um, that's pretty much gone. I think everything has been absorbed um, by this sort of what I've been called neo neoliberalism. Um, and it's uh, basically a capacity to co opt just about anything innovative or creative or anarchic and turn it into something that's going to make money. Not necessarily for those who create the anarchy, anarchy but there are others who are going to make. Uh, large profits. So, um, and they don't have any ideas of their own. You know, mostly straight white guys sitting up on top of a, a tower somewhere. They're pretty, no, they're not going to come up with anything interesting. So they need, you know, the masters need the slaves. Uh, the creativity of the slaves, they totally rely upon. So I think this master slave dynamic is extremely deep in our um, social fabric and where it's. And, we, and the way I, certainly the way it's set up. This is nothing new, but I think it's becoming extremely dramatic now. And I'm, a, I'm of the opinion, based upon my actual experience, that Aurobindo is, is also has a dream, but it's an outsider dream. And it isn't in Hinduism. I, don't, I think he makes a break with that tradition. And I think he aligns himself with something that that it was more anarchic in the West, which was Nietzsche, with his Superman motif. And I think that that has been co-opted and turned into this uh, real pseudo, you know, pseudo-human AI bullshit. Um, so I think there are alternatives, but I think they're going to be, um, what choices do we have? I think we have a lot of choice about what we pay attention to and, um, and what beliefs uh, limit us and what beliefs support us. And you know, you have a you have a choice about where you're going where you're going to put your energy and where you what you're going to focus your attention upon. And I believe the um the alternatives to suicide, um, which was is certainly understandable if you have a certain certain beliefs that this is all there is, um, and you have a, a disease or you're poor. Or you're rich and bored out of your mind. You've had it all. There's nothing left for you here. Then, you know, probably uh, pop a pill, numb yourself, or have another drink, or, you know, just end it all. Um, I think those are perfectly understandable responses. And if that's all there is, I would say, why not? You know, but I think that there's some um, alternatives to that. And I think we are a transitional being. Aurobindo declares that humans are transitional beings and we aren't finished and we may not, there may be no finish. Um, and I think that's interesting, is that possibility that we could material, uh, divinize matter um, 
and we could make that um, we could make that the project. Uh, and I think this is what Aurobindo, how he breaks with the Hindu tradition and the Buddhist tradition. But basically, let's get to Nirvana. Let's just it was, actually he thought Nirvana was a form of suicide. So he didn't um, he didn't go that direction. And um, I just think he's very um, worthwhile study right now. And I think Banerjee is, um, I, I think he is sort of departing from Aurobindo because he's uh, in the, he works at a, a CIS and he's a professor there. But he's, he, he said that Aurobindo and the mother were, came out of an ashram model. And uh, it was an ashram with a school but the ashram definitely dominated the psychology there. And um, he thought that they were in a bit of a bubble. And uh, we can learn something from that experiment at, at Oroville, um, but we, it should not be our intention to replicate it. Um, and I think that's um, what I think Banerjee is so, why he's so interesting because he's steeped in that tradition. And yet he's also, you know, lives and works in, in San Francisco. And I think he's oriented to a, a very different uh, set of uh, issues and, and social dynamics than Aurobindo was, who I think died in the 50s. Anyway, that's, that's um, my response. So I hope that's of use to somebody. Thank you. I am um, curious about this bubble idea and this ashram idea because you know, there's no way we can recreate that context. That was a very particular context. And Aurobindo lived in Pondicherry from something like 1910 until he died. So he had a solid 40, 30, 40 years of, uh, of time to really go very deep without a lot of distraction. We have a lot of distraction. We're hyper distracted and we're distributed in, in space, on, in space time, or at least, you know, on the earth. And so we're, we have to counteract the centrifugal and the sort of dispers this dispersive uh, forces of the world as it has emerged in a way, we have to re reconstitute some kind of bubble, I think. Uh, and I'm using that term lightly and loosely. I don't mean that in a, necessarily a slaughter Dykean sense, or um, it doesn't even really work in, because a bubble is very fragile. We need something a bit stronger than a, than a bubble, I think. Uh, but it, it seems to me that to the degree that we can coordinate and collaborate on this a project like this and experiment with it. This is an experiential, existential, experimental project. We could create some form, perhaps a psychic or virtual form mediated by the technology, which we're repurposing for our, our own ends. We could create some kind of container like the one or I shouldn't even say like, it'd be totally different, but uh, in, as, an, as a, let's say, a, uh, a iteration of, an expression of that, um, that same experiment that Aurobindo conducted in Pondicherry. Like, what can we draw from that into our context? I think that that's what Banerjee is, pointing to in, in, in some respects. He kind of speaks our language because he, he talks theory and he, 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 he knows this, this culture and this, this context. He's on Facebook, right? We could probably message him if, if we wanted to and um, interact with him. Uh, but we're, we're experimenting here. We don't exactly know what we're doing or how to do it. And so we have to have this... Uh, this these conversations i think and there's a sort of tentativeness uh that i've noticed 
like in the first couple of sessions we've done with Aurobindo, we're, of course, there are new people, we're getting to know each other, but there's also the sense that we, may, we could be on to doing something bigger than just a reading group. Uh, and I don't mean that in institutional ways, but in, in terms of effect, like what he calls the incalculable yoga. We could be on the verge of that, or it could just sort of fizzle and not really go somewhere. And how, what, how would we want it to go? How would we want to configure it? Like, how would we home, hone and, and focus our, our minds so that the time that we're putting into it, the effort that we're putting in, because it is certainly uh, takes time and effort, is, um, is fruitful in some way. Uh, and I'm, uh, I think you have a clear idea about that, John. Uh, I think that you intuit those possibilities. Uh, and w- what I've been pondering and struggling with, I think, is how to even articulate that in a way that doesn't sound too flaky or crazy or, um, you know, just idiosyncratic. Like, the, the, there's some different way of languaging and communicating that we may n- need to, to bring those forces together. And so I'm, I'm very open to thoughts and feedback on that. And, uh, and I think it's a creative thing too, that that's the, maybe one of the cool things that, that, that I really enjoy is that we have the weird and we have the paranormal and we have these sort of not too systematic, not too reverential even, uh, ways of relating to this kind of material. But, uh, just, a quick, quick a footnote on that. I I feel challenged by the text to be to become more clear, like to become a more uh, coherent thinker, because I think Aurobindo he models right. He exemplifies uh, a a very confident and competent grasp on on his mat on his subject matter on what he's talking about i I said this in our last talk that when i'm reading our bindo i feel like i'm reading somebody who knows what he's talking about so when he talks about brahmanic reality i can i feel like i perceive it just through reading through reading the material and then that has this afterglow effect in my ongoing perceptions and my ongoing experience So I'm, uh, I'm curious where this will go, uh, especially with our, uh, our Thursday groups because they're focused in a different way. And this cafe, I thought, might give us a chance to speak a little bit more loosely or a little bit more fr- you know, freely, free-flowingly uh, than, than we've done in those, in those first couple of Thursday talks. And here's some other perspectives too, because uh, I, you know, I think like Mark, like I was saying, I think that there's a certain truth and wisdom in not getting too wrapped up in, you know, another yoga, another theory, another philosophy, another like you. That I think I I think that that's true, um, but I wouldn't want to stop there, because uh, then <clears throat> there's not much more to talk about. We would just what? you know be. <laughs> Well, that's that's why people eat and drink together. It's fun. Uh, I think meditate if, or meditate together. It's yes, fun. and I Which was going. I good. was going there. I was going there. I think what you are not going to know what this is until there's some some history to it. In that, and you spoke about this in, in your paper, Marco, and, and John mentioned it a long time ago. When you go to a uh, seminar, workshop, conference, whatever, you know, whatever it is about a, a, a spiritual, 
retreat, revival, whatever. It, it's u- usually a, a group of people in a room. It might be 10, it might be 20, it might be 30. And there is a, a unity, an energy, and you get, you get this feeling that you don't get apart from that experience. And, and what you're doing here is, I think, asking the question, can that happen over this medium, this new technology? Can you create that sort of uh, oneness that you get in a room when you go to one of those retreats or something and everybody's on the same page and there's a leader directing you in meditation or yoga or something that can you get that feeling this in this medium and i don't think you're going to know that for a while yeah and it would have to be totally different too i mean it's a totally it's a different power structure yeah uh that's there's the, no guru here and they're you know we're not trying to uh i think inflict on each other a, a parent student or a teacher dynamic because that we're peer to peer here we're all equals but marcos and and you john you're bringing in these people who have written books who have an idea of some sort of solution they all have their own little variation. So, so there are gurus, if you want to use that word, teachers, whatever, who come in and, and then we talk about their work. Some people position themselves that way. Some people identify that way, I would say. Um, maybe not as absolute gurus. I mean, there are some gurus who really... Uh, 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 inflate their identity, let's say, uh, and others who are more friendly. You're like friendly neighborhood guru, who are <laughs> as, you know. That's your bartender. Much better, much better socialized, we could say. Yeah, like the bartender. Uh, <laughs> like t- t- Terry, for example. He 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 has he carries this guru energy. He he comes from a guru tradition. He was a devotee of Abhida. Abhida, the, the, I'm think, who I was thinking of in terms of a, a self-aggrandizing kind of guru. Um, but Terry is a much friendlier version of, of, of that. And uh, yeah, but he's not in charge. <laughs> so, so he could be, he could bring his, his self and whatever he, he has to offer. Uh, and um, it could be part of the mix, but it doesn't become the center. I think that's the difference is when you have the guru, the, the figure at, at the center of power in an organization or in a social context. Of course, that model has worked for many thousands of years in some places. And so it's not that that model is bad or wrong, but it's not the model here. And, uh, and I don't know if it's even a model that could work in this, like our internet digital reality. I think that it just may not fit. Uh, so, so, but, but there's something to be, there's something there. Like the guru means something in a community that is sincerely practicing a yoga. The guru is the exemplar of that, that higher state, that higher realization. At least that's the idea. And so where do you find the guru if there isn't, a guru uh and if you're not going to even put that guru at, at the at the, the center exactly of your you know mental construct of of, of of reality or what the community is it's kind of paradoxical because you know we don't quite have i think a tradition for it maybe we're constant maybe we're invent, inventing that the tradition or maybe we'll have to find it in, in some other through some other sources Maybe it's in Deleuze and, uh, you know, (laughs) Deleuze, um, he was a heavy smoker and, um, you know, you know, he jumped out of a window. He had cancer or maybe it was emphysema, but in a, 
he jumped out of a window in Paris and killed himself. Um, Aurobindo, in his late years, he evidently had a fall and broke his leg um, and had to hobble around. And, so, and one of his uh, servants or maybe one of his disciples just asked him, how could a highly enlightened master like yourself break a leg? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember how Aurobindo responded, um, but it must have been a humbling experience for him or for those who exalted Aurobindo. It was a humbling experience for them to realize their guru could fall down and break a leg just like anybody, just like any other old person or young person for that matter. And um, William Irwin Thompson, you know, who wrote Coming Into Being, he was the Fendus, he, he, he gathered the, the, the Fendus, his Lindisfarne, mm -hmm. a very uh, a great group of outsiders who came together, Gregory Bates and Hazel Henderson, some geniuses in that group, Varela, and uh, they all pulled their res intellectual resources and, and created something I think is genuinely American, transdisciplinary at its best. But he said he was in Oroville and he did, um, I don't think he met Aurobindo. Maybe Aurobindo had passed away already, but he met the mother. And uh, he said she had, you know, advanced um, sclerosis. He was one of the most, she, he said she was one of the most twisted uh, physically persons he'd ever seen. So it was quite advanced. And she was, I think, in her 80s or 90s and working, walking with a cane. Um, but he said that night after meeting her and uh, briefly, he had a dream and she was there and she was, and he said, it's a very powerful Shakti. And she was uh, basically telling, giving him a command. Uh, he, she wanted him to be a part of the, the membership and she had a, an assignment for him. And when he got up the next day, he said, um, no, lady, I have my own plan. <laughs> you know, thank you very, very much for your blessing, but I have my own thing. And he came back to uh, the States and um, created his own uh, center where he was not a guru at all, but he was basically a facilitator and a host uh, for many different um, alternative um, knowledge to start to emerge. This is, I think, in the 80s and the 90s when that, organization was flourishing. Um, but anyway, I'm just bringing that up because I think Banerjee is very aware of the, the cultish behavior, I'm sure, of a lot of the people who came into or Oroville and who were just enchanted by the, the aura and the mystique of this um, very charismatic um, couple who everyone says that they were not physically in involved, but it was a kind of spiritual marriage. But I just don't think that's the for me, that holds any appeal at all. Um, I think they were very unique persons and they were channeling some very big energy. And I don't think it worked out that they, the way everything worked out the way they wanted to. You know, I think that that's just pure romanticism on our part that, you know, that, that we need these avatars or, or perhaps people at a certain level of development need avatars, but I don't. I, I think a lot of that, uh, glamour and, um, you know, wanting other people to uh, have the power. And uh, it's, it all comes out of a parent-child dynamic that um, you're lucky if you outgrow it. If you do, it's probably sometimes very painful and disillusioning. Um, and I think you went through that too with, I, I think Wilbur had, had, there were cultish elements in Wilbur's community for sure. He was a very charismatic and, and very wise in many ways in the person. But I think he um, uh, he didn't have it all together, you know, and certainly some of the people that he chose in leadership positions didn't have it together either. They weren't able to handle that energy, and it blew them blew them apart. I think they've regrouped, and they, I think, uh, learned how to monetize. That's for sure. I got an invitation from Ken Wilbur to come to his um, his loft for a weekend um, to have a transformational experience for a mere five thousand dollars. I de I declined. <clears throat> There's a payment plan option now, by the way. Oh, cool. So I, I pay my $500 a month for the next year or so. Okay. Anyway, I think that I, I think I'm doing fine on my own. And with the, the, the colleagues that I pick up, the allies that I pick up 
on the way and we try to consolidate our our learnings and in a peer to peer fashion and it's kind of messy and probably um you know uh fraught with peril uh, but i think that it's it's uh more interesting and probably more pragmatic than shelling out five you know getting five thousand dollars together so i can go to a mountaintop for a weekend big fucking deal then i have to come back and start all over again <laughs> <laughs> i've been to retreats and i've gone to the retreats the weekends the, the week-long the month-long retreats and you have to come back and it's the conditions having had those elevated experiences back in the valley when you have to return conditions are much worse i found myself much worse off than if i had just uh, muddled on through the best way i could um because nothing changes at all it just it, it even handicaps you um uh, you got to transform here in the valley in the middle of the shit <laughs> you know you can't do that on a mountaintop i'm sorry guys i live i live in manhattan and it just doesn't work well it's it's very similar to the a vacation uh, crash right uh, you, you save up for a vac- you go on a vacation and and what if it's good then when you get back to your real life there's a depression a valley that you you know why can't i be on vacation all the time right. and then when you do that then you go is this all there is right <laughs> so, but isn't Aurobindo kind of offering vacation all the time? I mean, isn't that what Satchidananda <laughs> is? Well, I think the mother had a lot to do with that setup. He was he was able for 30 years after a huge output to basically, you know, hang out in his room and meditate and write a few letters to his disciples. Come out four four times a year for darshan. But the mother ran the place. And from Michael Murphy's description of her, and he was in Orville, Orville, Orville for a while, she was not um, she was not the most serene and magnanimous, glowing person. She was a very pragmatic person. She was running that place, and uh, she evidently watched everything, coming and going. And, uh, you know, everyone had to be fed, and people had to have a place to sleep, and they had to keep the educational facility, you know, going. And she had to get funds. And that was a lot of what she did, was raising money so that Aurobindo could, you know, radiate out into the cosmos, whatever he was radiating. And I'm not, I'm just saying that's often the case. When you have these um, ashrams, that's the way they run. And uh, Michael Murphy said that she, he thought she was a bit, um, she was a bit um, expensive. He didn't, I, I, I don't want to, there's an element of exploitation. I mean, she really, she, she wanted, she worked you. She wanted funds. You know, she, that was a very important part of the maintenance of that place. So, you know, and there were a lot of wealthy uh, Westerners who came in there and who were, who were probably very happy to, uh, to be generous because they felt the message was a very, a one that they wanted to um, encourage what, the work that they were doing. So I just think as Banerjee, as he comes to this country and he's working at CIS out in San Francisco, uh, a very unusual uh, educational center, which is cultivating what they're calling the integral. Um, you know, he's talking about how they how they balance all of these um, uh, these energies in a, in a kind of big commercial city like San Francisco, where you can't get an apartment in San Francisco, it's as bad as New York. It's, everything is very inflated there and very expensive and, and they're highly competitive. So I think it's not going to be easy to find the conditions that are right for um, this, um, I, I think this, for uh, realizing this, that, that we are, humans are in transition and probably in a per- permanent state of transition. I don't think Aurobindo thought you you make it to the mountaintop and that's it. Um, you have to crawl back down the mountain, go into the valley, and you have to continue to uh, to make these translations. And I think that's um, you know there's no end in sight. I can't imagine um, 
that uh, anybody who's had any of these experiences would just say, oh, I'm done with that. I've been there. I've done that. You know, I can just sit in a lotus pose um, for the rest of my, my, my life. I think the idea of divinizing matter is a very compelling um, and very new uh, innovation, I think, in the, in, in the spiritual traditions, which have been so much about that beam me up, you know, into nirvana and to infinite bliss. I think that um, now I think there are enough of us who've done that. And it's, it's incredibly boring. You just can't swim around in oceans of golden light. <laughs> You've got to come back to planet Earth eventually. And there's a, a very um, different relationship you're going to have. And I think that's uh, excruciating too, because you have to sort of adapt to the very fragmented um, and nefarious forces, which, are, which I call neoliberalism. Um, but I think that how you do that is going to depend on each person and the, the conditions that they're in and what conditions do they want to create and what aspect of the past and what aspect of the future are they tuning into? Because I think we do have choices about how we're going to use our imagination. And, um, I, I, and, and that's what I've hope, hope I've, I've uh, brought to some of our exchanges here is it's, it's the imagination or the imaginal. I think the imaginal is sort of uh, incredibly more intense than the imagination. But I think- Can I give you a, an image? But on, on Thursday, I'm supposed to do the introduction and this popped into my head uh, based on my own personal, like I said, I, about 10 years ago, I read the book. And then once I started digging into Auroville, I was like, ah, I don't know about all this stuff. Uh, so I, that, that was one of the aspects that kind of turned me away from the whole Aurobindo um, spiel in a certain sense. Um, but I, I imagine in the weird way that I do with whatever introduction I have, um, some sort of conversation with Aurobindo, but that what, what's happened in the real world in this fake or this alternate world that I formed is uh, there's Aro world uh, forming. So it's, it's kind of the Auroville gets taken over by Auro world, which is in a sense like Disney world. Um, it has all sorts of spiritual acrobatics going on. There's, there's Aurobatics, our, our robotics, aromatics is in the gift shop. Um, there, there's a few other things I, I forgot, but uh, so there's like six corridors around there that lead to, I've also been reading Slaughter Dykes, You Must Change Your Life. So that, that's kind of the aerobatics aspect because he talks about acrobatics, uh, the vertical line that you must uh, tread upon, which I guess comes from Nietzsche. Um, but the... The first chapter we, we're going to be focusing on is the ego and the dualities, I think, or man in the universe, possibly. But the, the little quote from one of the Upanishads talks about soul as a traveler. So that there's going to be some soul that travels in as an outsider and witnesses this sorrow world. And uh, eventually she makes it to this center where there's a hologram of Aurobindo. Uh, which nobody goes to anymore because they're all about all the outside stuff going on and which I haven't worked this fully out yet, but she, she's going to be the, the one on the quest in a certain sense, asking questions like, why, why am I here? What the hell is going on <laughs> type of thing. And then our Obendo will hologram will provide quotes from the book. But so that's, that's can, my I, little can I ask you a question, there. Doug? Yeah, go um, ahead. And Auroville, and there's six corridors, and there's aerobotics, and there's <laughs> aerobatics, and there's an Auro hologram, and and something about ego um, in the first chapter. With all of that, is there a relationship between all of that and nothingness? Mm. Not at the moment, no. It's it's a little bit of everything, I guess. That doesn't tie back into the nothingness just yet. But once once maybe the the traveler gets a chance to kind of get past the existential crisis, maybe 
uh, or of the world around that causes causes us to go back to our individual self. Um, there there will be a dipping into not the nihil or nihil, whatever, however you pronounce it, but the the nothingness, and use that as one aspect of the the full gamut of what's around us at any given time. But I, I, I think is there is there a relation between this vision of like a corporate Disney kind of version of spiritual practice, let's say. Uh, I mean, like in this vision, it's almost like it's like the metamodern dream, right? That everybody develops psychologically to the point where that would be interesting to them. That would be more, you know, mm-hmm. there'd be enough money in it that somebody would build this Auroville and they'd have probably advertising and, uh, you know, it, it would just be so... It'd be like Trump world, you know, with, with the big, except with without the Trump at the, the in in shining neon lights, it would be uh, or window. He, or he's killing it right now in uh, North Korea, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's your boy. Anyway, um, it, it, this vision of whatever you want to call it, actually, and I have maybe one dream a week, but uh, I forget his name. But the other long-haired mystic in our uh, reading group, the German is it's not Fabio, but something uh, similar. Flo, Say it again. Flo, Flo, I think is his name. Flo. Yeah, he goes by Flo. Um, but I, I had this image of him in my dream inside, kind of like, not necessarily a, like a gym, but it was just an area where there was kind of his personal space. He wasn't lifting weights or anything like that, but he was maybe playing piano. Or I, I don't, It wasn't vivid in that sense, but um, there's this, which this goes along with, the whole possible formation of the the world but there's there was the outside world coming in and i'm i'm inside with him kind of foreseeing this coming this world of this mob of the massive crazy world outside coming in and people just start punching the glass and essentially burst through and i i'm not stressed out in the dream but i'm thinking well this is not good. And he's just sort of sitting there hanging out, continually doing what he's doing unfazed by the world around him. So that's, that's kind of the metaphor there. Um, that how it arose along with my own personal experience of reading the book and all that, but I don't want to go too far into it now. But is it, is the idea that this, 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 let's say commercialization of spirituality is all becomes maya it all becomes this fm this empty in the sense of that void of substance or meaning mm-hmm. kind of phenomena or so, expression. so it comes from anything i'm hearing right now of people microdosing lsd so they can experience better productivity in their business world job um which kind of maybe they also sense the spiritual aspect of it or natural aspect but it's and the their end goal is productivity the tim ferris kind of morphing his body to to become what he desire or just to experiment with his body like there's an aspect of that that is great maybe or and in the arobindo sense that like he's as an individual he's doing that but at the same time he's also monetized off of it he's written books on it he it's hard to trust somebody like that and my even if he is extremely sincere like i've not met the guy tim Fer- i don't know if any of you here know who tim ferris is but um just that i and even wim hoff <laughs> like i i can i keep going back to extracting these elements which we've talked about like i'll take a cold shower but i'm not going to go to a wim hoff monastery that seems to be possibly forming um and I'm not going to go to Tim Ferriss talk just so I can experience. I'm going to extract. Well, he, he did a sleep cycle where he can sleep two hours, wake up for one, sleep two more hours. And he is very productive in this sense, but I don't want to do it so I can create a bestseller. I just want to do it because I want to be a better person. Uh, 
a lot of other examples uh, aren't coming to mind, but it's just the outside and, and technology in general seems to be gearing toward like the neurotechnological entrainment, things like that, um, which we've had John and Ed typically are against any of that type of stuff. And oh, at, at least on a ma- at least on a mass unconscious scale, maybe, or just monetary capital, neoliberal scale. Um, if that makes any sense. But yeah, I appreciate I, helping me articulate this now. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> you're not against Am technology, I? right, John? You're not like... Ag- no, I never... No, no. But... I'm not against technology. Please, let me make that clear. I've used all kinds of devices for, for changing my brain waves. I've been I've been doing it for years, and I've also don't need any devices to change my brain waves. I can do it with language, um, and to me, that's much more ecological. Um, and that's probably one of the experiments that I've been offering to the group, is working with clean language. It's a it's a totally different style, um, but I think it has the same. It has the, all the benefits of, of deep trance, without going into a trance. You can just do it with words. And you can have uh, large impacts, I believe, on the physiology, the nervous system, and on, the, and on the, the subtle bodies of whoever is there, whether we're in the same room or we're doing it online like we are now. So I think there's a, a lot of uh, untapped possibilities and potentials. But let's use all of our knowledge and use it all, all of it well. And I would think uh, reading Aaron Manning and the minor gesture uh, the beauty of a minor gesture, just changing the baby's diapers in an attentive way may be enough, you know, have that cup of coffee or that glass of bourbon, <laughs> you know? but do it mindfully. Don't do it stupidly. And I think those are the, you know, you're driving your car, listening to a radio. You can do both of those at the same time and you can drift off into a, a lovely, um, another possibility on another p- parallel universe. Um, I think the I think our uh, everyday uses of our bodies and our minds are are absolute miracles, and our technology I think uh, generates all kinds of choices for us. I just think it can be uh, uh, also all of these choices. Too many options can become a terrible burden. I don't know how many of you, I've had the experience of standing there looking at produce or looking at a row of cans and looking at the information, what's in them. I can spend an hour getting a few items, you know, and am I, am I, and it's just, it, it, after a while, it just becomes, you know, time management. Who has the time to do all of that? So all those options can become a, a tremendous burden. But I think that the, the, the small gestures are extremely important for us be, to be paying attention to. And I think it's also, we can get very inflated by the Orville and the the mother and the avatar and all that stuff. I think it's, it can lend itself to, those are very big gestures, um, grand gestures, and we need them. We need the grand narratives, but we also need those, um, those little small and probably even unremembered acts of kindness and of love. I think words were said, they all add up um, over a lifetime into something that we couldn't even imagine. How could we even fu- function at all if there weren't enough people who were just doing those kind, you know, kind gestures to strangers for, for no good reason? They're not going to get a reward for it. I just saw an old man in the gym. Um, he's humped over, um, you know, and it's it's very laborious for him to do, the, you know, to shower and to shave. And I think he's homeless. He has a little cart full of stuff. And he was walking past me and I noticed that he had, he had dropped something. So I, I went and picked it up. It was an old sock or something. And I followed him. And, um, you know, I just tapped on his shoulder because I think he's deaf. And he turned around and he looked at me. And I said, oh, I think, it, sir, I think you dropped something. And he had this the most beautiful eyes, <laughs> you know. And he said with this clear, little British accent, he said, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You know, <laughs> thought, oh, he's a real character, you know. And, but I felt, I felt a transmission coming from, you know, this old homeless guy. You know, right out of a Beckett play, I thought, "Wow, he, he zapped me with his, with his with his energy." So those minor gestures, I think, are something that um, we can all um, look forward to each day. 
we can sort of open ourselves up to those possibilities. And those serendipitous, serendipitous learning events are all over the place. Maybe that's a good place to end it. Top of the hour. Um, we took a pretty circuitous route through this conversation. I'll have to go back and try to reconstruct some kind of view on it. Uh, but I uh, I appreciate it, uh, as, as always. And... Um, Let's see. Uh, we 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 uh, we're maybe going to talk about suicide next week, or the media, or something like that. That was something you proposed, Mark. I don't I don't know if I have the heart the the stomach for it. To be honest, um, well, I'm. I'll just say one thing. Uh, I didn't watch uh, Anthony Bourdain. A few times, but but I, it was curious when 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 it happened, uh, and so I went back and I watched an episode of Parts Unknown. His his personal story is well worth digging into. Uh, but he was in Armenia. He went to Armenia, and I had no idea about Armenia, and. It's it's well worth watching. He he goes and he's been doing this for fifteen years now on on the TV, and he's he's creating these incredible stories and and not letting the machine dictate to him what he does. And uh, the one on Armenia, uh, it's a Christian country surrounded by all these other uh, Iran and all these other hostile places. And they, they suffered a genocide back in 1915. And so they scattered and there's maybe a million people in the country now. And there's like 8 million people who call themselves Armenians. And they went all over the world. The U.S., Britain, and and the the country valued the mind, and they start t- public school. They start teaching their children chess in like the second grade. It's part of the curriculum, and it's just a, a fascinating. Uh, uh, they're kind of like documentaries, but what he does, he, he just goes to these countries, finds some people, and they cook them some food, and they drink, and they eat, and, and they tell their story. And I, I had no idea. It, and, and part of it is but the, the, the pull of the homeland and the country and the identity with a group of people. I didn't know Armenians from, you know, what the hell is the difference? You know, they have a food and a culture, and uh, it's a landlocked little country. And and like I said, it, one of the biggest genocides uh, ever. Millions of people were killed. It's a fascinating story. Anyway. Well, it reminds me of uh, Gao Zhijing in Soul Mountain, because in that book, you know, he's traveling through the Chinese countryside the, where there are many different peoples and traditions and cultures with their own songs, their own food, their own ways of talking, the inflections and very many, many differences, which are erased by the Chinese communist state and the cultural revolution that happened, you know, in, uh, under Mao, uh, Mao Zedong. Uh, and in a way, what he does as an author, as a novelist is to tell those stories, kind of bring those into, into language and bring them into an artistic work. So it sounds like Bourdain is doing something it, similar. It, like yeah, you can just on CNN. Go, you can just Google him, and and well, there's just a ton of stuff now because he, it's again killing yourself to live, <laughs> sort of. Yeah, uh, but there's that. 
talking about, you know, a, a super mind or a singularity, but people all over the world are, are united by their culture and by their language. <clears throat> and all people share certain things, but they each have their, I don't know, peculiarities a culture, a tribe, a people. Uh, and, and, and that's the most powerful thing there is. It's just, you know, and yeah, it's all over the world. You know, these little the pockets. That, it's the kind of thing that gets lost in the, in the grand meta narrative. I think that those, that level of detail, that level of intimacy, I think. Yeah. Lost and what, what Bourdain did was it, it, the one on CNN was parts unknown before that he, had a show on the travel network, I think, called Without Reservations. And he'd just pop in on these places all over the world without a reservation. Right, right. I like that. Uh, and, and yeah, just work with the local people. You know, they feed them and uh, some of the stuff is, yeah, it's uh, just fascinating. Uh, yeah, I guess the other, just to, the connection with what Doug you were saying before the, the self as a product and how when you know the way that we construct ourselves becomes commodified and core, even even our spiritual selves like that's another way of I think erasing the um, all the local variations and all the the, the the deep the deeper aspects of how we you know our, of our life. Uh, our worlds. I think maybe that's what you're talking about, uh, Mark, with Anthony Bourdain or with you know, Gao Zhejiang. I like having both, really. I, I think it's important to have to have the sensitivity to to the local and the particular, without getting, without interpreting it through, reading it through a meta narrative. That's really for me why I had to leave Wilbur's orbit is because I I, I just got so sick of interpreting everything through the integral meta narrative. I just wanted to see things and experience things as they were. And like I moved here, we started a family, got, got to know my neighbors, got involved in local issues. Uh, none of that had anything to do. I didn't need integral meta theory for that. I wouldn't, I didn't, I wouldn't need supermind for that. I just needed to be here and go for a walk and bump into somebody and have a conversation. Uh, and that that's the minor gesture that I think that John you're talking about. So, but really, it there there, there is some tension between them. I find, at least in my experience, like that. You you know, I could go to the super mind. I could have these transcendent kinds of conversations, but then to come back and uh, be in this reality, like this one here, three D. Uh, it takes some phase shifting that is not always easy to, to accomplish. And I can get kind of stuck in one or the other kind of in between. I, I, I'm wondering, I'm speculating because I don't know Bourdain at all, except from the, the, the popular press has made a lot about his suicide, but maybe he, he wasn't having a smooth transition. He sounds like he was a very advanced soul in many ways. Extremely uh, sensitive. He didn't have a disease, evidently. So it wasn't well, because he, he had was... a he had a uh, uh, he had a relationship with a young uh, artist. She was he was sixty one. She was forty two. He had two previous wives, and she was on Instagram, and they weren't together. And she was maybe carrying on some sort of relationship with another dude. And her father was a, a, a avant-garde filmmaker. And it, it's just a fascinating story. The whole, the whole thing just, you know, it kind of encompasses all of what we're talking about, about reality and, and, and different realities in the world. And, uh, and food, and the, uh, it's just unbelievable story that you can, you know, it happened 
two, three days ago, and you can just put it all, you know, put all these different things that we've been talking about. And he was, he wasn't rich and famous. He was, he was poor and in, in New York until he was your age, Marco, 42 or something. And as he wrote a, he wrote a, a story for, uh, you know, tried to sell it and nobody would, you know, he got nothing. And his mother says, send it to the New Yorker. So he sends it to the New Yorker and they publish it. And then they want him to write a book, which turns into Kitchen Confidential, which is what happens behind the, you know, we call it the back of the house in the restaurant business. And that it just exploded. And, and he went from being in debt and, and poor and everything to this all of a sudden, yeah, he's a, he was incredible person. He had that ability to go to all these different people and, and come together over food and, and turn the world on to all this stuff. And, and he was a no nonsense. Uh, it's just a fascinating story that I think we could spend if people want to look at, at stuff or read his books or watch his show, we could spend two hours talking about it. Easy. It's good stuff. That, well, was, that, that was my thing. Well, well what makes, makes him interesting to me is that he's, uh, that there's um, his story and then there's those who are grieving for him. There seem yeah. to be a lot of celebrities. Yes. Who evidently were very charmed by him or touched by him, but who, who are very saddened by his oh. passing. And then the way he passed, which was suicide. Because a lot of people, I think, are very stirred by someone's suicide, uh, especially if they were friends with that person or knew them, because they feel like, oh, my God, maybe I could have done something, or maybe they, he needed a friend and I wasn't there. So I think it does touch people in a different way. Um, yeah, and that, that's what it. interests me, is when people, we see people who are accomplished in so many ways, and we think, oh, well, that guy's got it made, and then when they decide to terminate their life, um, and he did. He did. He did the opposite of selling out to be rich and famous. He was just like, uh, you know. Uh, and as far as I know, he didn't have nobody who came in contact with him went away feeling poorly, negative. I mean, he just was a, you know, a wonderful like person who could relate to people. All, all over the globe. Well, 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 my interest is in transitions. We are transitional beings, and we've already made many transitions. From we were born, we went from babyhood to, you know, to being able to walk, from crawling to walking, to riding a bicycle, to growing up, and you know, some of us had have had babies of our own here, and so I think there are transitions that we. We are, we are going through. I just think that um, right now with the technology, we are uh, collectively transitioning to something and we don't know what that is. Whereas before the previous transitions, you know, I've never been a teenager before, but I know other people have been teenagers before. I can write, I can read what they wrote. I can go see movies about James Dean, you know, and I can sort of piece together out of uh, all this stuff some sort of imaginative response so i can get through this next phase that's coming up and i think that we've all learned through literature movies or whatever how to make these transitions happen but i think we're in a in a in a, in a unique time and i think that we're all it, it's, it's all hitting us all at once but we're all already at different stages i'm in my mid-60s and um doug is like in his mid-30s and i think there's um yet i think there's and I see much older people than myself, and they're being zapped by this technology, people in their 80s and their 90s, and they're trying to figure it out too. And then there are children, you know, young, young children, nervous systems just starting to develop, and they're being bombarded by uh, all of this overstimulation. So, you know, I, I, and, I, and, I, and I have friends in my 20s, you know, who are, who are dealing with all kinds of issues as well. So I think it's a it's a hodgepodge and I but I do think it would be helpful to have some beliefs that are useful 
to have, such as, you know, this is, um, I, I, I have a belief based upon my experience, and I think that uh, it's expressed here very well by Banerjee, that if, if we know ourselves to be free and self-determining, and that we, we are uh, connected with this conscious being, and that we are each uh, a unique, uniquely derived from that, that that can generate possibilities. And that I think those are useful. Now, that may not work for Mark. Mark, you're a, you know, you're a materialist and you think this is the end of the, end of the line, you know? And I'm, I'm fine with that. So that, that I'm fine that that works for you. And that may catalyze all kinds of imaginative responses. Um, so I think that there's e each of us, and I'm not just a relativist, uh, but I think each of us goes through these transitions in the best way we can. And I know when I was in high school, I was definitely a, went through a, a, an atheist pe period where I didn't believe in God. Uh, but now in my 60s, I've lost a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people die and held hands with a lot of people as they passed through the, through the veil. And I've had lots of experiences which don't fit in any of them, anything that I've heard reported. So I had to sort of figure it out my own way. And I think that a lot, Aurobindo probably did as well, even though he draws a lot upon the Hindu tradition. I think there's a lot of novelty and innovation that's, that uh, is coming through us, probably because of our, where we are and our personal interests, but also the technology is just ramping up things enormously. So, uh, you know, I think that's what interests me is how how our relationship to death and dying might be changing. <clears throat> I have a friend with Parkinson's disease, and I got you know when um, Ray, um, the, the famous comedian Will Williams Robin when Williams. he died, well, when when he died of Park, he had Parkinson's. He didn't. He wasn't manifesting it any symptoms in public. Um, he, he committed suicide before that happened. But I have a friend who has advanced Parkinson's and he's had it for 15 years. And prior to that, he had a couple, he had a stroke. So I've seen, he was a dancer, a beautiful dancer. And I see this happen, but uh, you know, he, he's, he's sharp as a tack and he wants to live. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm in that in between, you know, I, I, I would su I support him in any way he wants me to. You know, whatever he wants, I'll support him in that. Um, so I, I can't reach a conclusion for anybody else, but I know, you know, my own feeling is if I have any limiting beliefs and if I can change them, I should, because I want to make the most of this um, particular incarnation. And I think we're surrounded by forces that want to keep us small and stupid and consuming as much as possible. Um, and then that happens, especially as you get older. I think the, the images of geriatric wards and old people drooling in their soup is, is just like, uh, it's, it's just like uh, imprinted very deeply in our culture that, that it's inevitable that um, aging is going to be, is a, is a kind of disaster. So I'm trying to cut, cut my way, uh, my own path through all of that cultural uh, uh, indoctrination what I would call very bad hypnosis. Um, so, and I think each of us has to figure that out for themselves. How much of the culture are you going to take on and how much of it are you going to reject and do something else? Because I think you can do it your own way. The older you get, I think you have to do that. So that's my spiel. Thank you all. Yeah, all right. Doug, any last words? You're muted, delayed, so we'll take. He looks happy. He looks yeah, happy. He's smiling though. Did it unmute? No. Yeah. I, for whatever reason, it wouldn't unmute. But I can't, <laughs> no, nothing to add. Um, I guess we'll stick with our typical, or at least our recent typical. If not by Thursday, then go back to the painter G Tech. So is that kind of the, the thing? Or are we officially saying that? Um, suicide on Tuesday, but not suicide per se. It's everything. 
let's let, I'd like to if, if we talk about Bourdain I, I want to watch some videos and stuff I can't commit to that right yet we're going to do Mother tomorrow we have Aurobindo on Thursday um, and I have a bunch of other stuff going on um, so but what about Kurt Cobain and um, you know other famous people who committed suicide he was an artist yeah he was young when he committed suicide I remember the moment I learned that Kurt I remember Cobain. too so I think uh-huh. I think we should open it up, not just to Bourdain, but maybe to other people who decided to well, they're, they're, suicide for maybe very creative reasons. I don't know. There, maybe, is, sorry. there is a book that uh, my son just went to see the author called Killing Yourself to Live, Chuck Klosterman, and he did a road trip around the U.S., visiting the sites where Kurt Cobain and all these famous people died, either killed themselves or, or died prematurely. And he, and he tried to put the whole thing together as to, and, and the book is called killing, killing myself to live. Interesting. All right. So it. we need a topic for next week. Let's talk about it then. And uh, I'll, I'll watch something. I'll watch a clip of Bourdain just to, to kind of get a, you know, yeah, let's put for, it. for his personality. But we have David Foster Wallace. We have yeah. Robert Williams. David Foster have, Wallace would be a good one too. You yeah. guys know him really well. Yeah. You must have some feelings about his suicide. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we talk I think that we should open up that topic if you want it. I just don't want to sit and watch Bourdain because yeah. he's already dead. I don't want to become a fan of this guy if he's already dead. Well, oh, his work, his art. His art lives on, all of them. He was an art. He was an artist. He was an artist. Hmm. Yeah. All right, and and there's also the transcendental suicide of absorption in passive Brahman, or and, yeah. Uh, let's put it down the road. Let's not do it next week. But, you know, let everybody. We could, if we, we could, we could. Let's see what comes up. We, we have till Thursday. If we if we need a topic, we can we can turn toward it, and it would be good for to talk about it for me as well, for sure. Because it's, uh, you know, as I've experienced depression, I think about, and I've thought about it. So uh, I want to be in dialogue with it. You know, that's a, that's an aspect that's of, well, of Brahman. It, it seems that neoliberalism offers all of us assisted suicide at the end. Um, it seems like euthanasia is, um, I think that people in the Netherlands can get it easily there but uh it's this i, I think this Kurt, uh, dr Kurvakian, vakian what's his name the assisted suicide uh-huh. guy i think this is a a product of this neoliberalism run amok and at the end of the road um if you haven't developed any of these latent capacities then or even if you've had but you haven't understood them i think you create the conditions for this um uh, a real dark night. Neoliberal provides a tunnel either. That's good. Um, all right. Well, let's 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 come back to it. Let's develop the theme over the week. We have the topic, so that's good. We're, we're a step ahead of the game. Uh, and I think I've been thinking a lot about the self as a product. The assisted suicide at the end is sort of the, the expiration date of your product. It's where you you know put it. Uh, put it into the recycling bin, uh, as it were. And yeah, and, and that won't change unless we want to change it. Hmm. That, that's really, I think, um, the bottom line is, are you going to go with that or are you going to do something different? If you're going to do something different, then you're probably um, going to need some allies because uh, I don't think any of us are going to get to any other level without some sort of support for that. Because there's a lot of support the assisted suicide direction that's what nursing homes are for that's what the big pharmaceutical companies want to do and uh, well there's also i mean i i have a lot to say about this so you know we'll write it up we'll we'll table it we'll table it but till next week yeah all right thank you guys thank you bye-bye are are we staying on marco you gonna oh yeah you want tech support Yeah, I'll stop the recording and see you next time. Bye bye. All right. Bye, John. Thank you.